everyone and hello again. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm super happy to, to sit here with uh, Maria from Readily um, to talk on a very delicate topic, actually. And it's about like when founders hand over to another person and you come in as an external manager to basically take over their baby, um, which actually happened to both of us. And uh, I'm very, very personally excited about the talk to also learn from Maria uh, yeah, how her journey was and also to share my own very personal story because I think it's always a, a very emotional story. And I guess that's why we all laugh, right? Emotional stories. So let's go on, Maria. Tell us your story. What is the founding story of Readily? How did you get into your position? Yeah, thanks, Christine. I'm also super excited to be here and to hear your story. But if I uh, start with Readily, uh, our founder, Joel Bikel, he's a serial entrepreneur. And uh, in 2012, he was on holiday in Cyprus and came up with the idea. He was uh, by the pool and uh, he was frustrated because he ran out of magazines to read. Um, so he thought he was listening to music and he was like, I want like a Spotify for magazines. Like I want to carry around all my favorite content on my mobile. So since he's a tech entrepreneur, he went home and built the thing, right? And the rest is, as they say, history. So that's how really was founded is uh, the European category leader in digital magazine subscriptions. And uh, we're around a million users today uh, in 12 markets. Uh, and we have offices in Paris, in Sweden, in, in Berlin, and in, in London. Um, and uh, yeah, we have content from uh, 1,200 publishers all over the world. So, and how I came into the picture is that um, uh, Joel, uh, he is no longer active in the business. Uh, for a while he was uh, first the CEO and founder, of course, and then he moved on to the board of directors and now he's uh, just an owner. And uh, the, um, you heard my background is also from iSettle. So how I was uh, introduced to the business is that uh, the largest shareholder of iSettle was also a large shareholder in Readly. So uh, when uh, PayPal acquired iSettle, uh, that company is a venture capital firm, asked if I wanted to uh, join Readly instead and had it as a CEO. So that's why how I got introduced to the business. And I love tech, I love magazines. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was no brainer. So tell me about you and Nuri. Before I tell you about Nuri, um, what was your first thought when they approached you and asked you if you want to take over as a CEO? Yeah, I, it was, I was just uh, really thrilled and excited. So uh, I'm, I'm like that. I don't always think about, uh, you know, wow, what is this going to be? You know, um, I just do it because it sounded amazing and then I figure it out later. Uh, but it's an interesting topic that we're going to talk about today. Like you said, it's a bit too sensitive maybe even, you know. So, um, yeah, so tell me about Nuri. So actually, Nuri was called Bitwala until uh, 18th of May this year. So it was founded by uh, three guys in Berlin, by Jörg von Minkwitz, by Jan Goslicki and Ben Jones. Um, three friends that were super active in the crypto and mainly in the Bitcoin scene in Berlin very early on, like 2012. These are the, the lucky dudes that actually invested in Bitcoin when Bitcoin was around 60 euro. Uh, I was not one of these lucky people, by the way. Um, so they actually um, started initially with a product uh, to make your Bitcoin spendable. So they solved their own problem because they had a lot of Bitcoin and they actually wanted to, to use it for payments. Um, in the real world, right? Uh, so we always talk about Bitcoin as a payment use case. However, in the real world, you somehow need to ha have a card. Um, so they actually connected uh, crypto wallets first with a, um, with a Visa card. Um, Along the line, uh, the, the credit card provider lost its license, so they actually had to come up with a new product within just a very short amount of time. Uh, and that was basically how, um, how Biswala was founded. Uh, so they actually combined a traditional banking account uh, with the possibility to buy crypto right from your bank account. So it's a combination of the traditional world of banking uh, with a blockchain-based world of banking. So uh, we offer a custodian wallet setup, a non-custodial wallet setup, and the opportunity to put Bitcoin into an interest account and earn interest on it. So Jörg von Minkwitz was initially the CEO. He left the company at the end of like 2018. Um, then at some point, Ben Jones, the CTO, took over and uh, was then the CEO and the CTO of the company. 
And uh, yeah, he was the person that actually started to approach me on LinkedIn uh, last year many times, uh, a time when I was working at N26. Uh, and I was already working on disrupting the banking world. Um, but then he came up with his crazy ideas. And while working in a new bank, in a pretty large new bank, actually, I also understood that we're pretty limited when it comes to, to build financial innovation. So eventually, after the third LinkedIn email, I get back to him and I said, okay, tell me, tell me about your product. I want to learn more. And uh, so he hired me initially as a chief product officer. That was already the first question because I asked him, what do you want from me? I'm not coming from the crypto background as you guys. But he said, we're looking for um, a consumer facing product person that can help us to bring the product more towards the mess. Um, so I joined them as a chief product officer last year in September. And the guys didn't give me a lot of time for onboarding. They wanted to see a new product vision within a few weeks put me in front of investors for fundraising after week five. And um, as we were about to scale the company, I was sitting next to my CEO all the time. And he told me, this is how we're going to do it. And I said, nah, we're going to do it differently because I had a, um, a background in larger tech companies. And I think after three months, he was so annoyed by it that he said at some point, Christina, do you just want to take over? <laughs> And I said, hell no, I don't want to. And he said, no, no, I'm serious. I just like, after working with you for three months, I have the feeling like you bring so much experience how, from large companies. You went through so many hyper growth phases with Salando, with N26. So I think you way, know way better what our company needs in the next stage. And then I looked at him and I started crying. Like literally, that's what I did. I started crying and I asked him if he's insane. Um, and then I also took quite some time to think about it because I knew it's not a job anymore. It's, it's like a birth of your baby. <laughs> I imagine I don't have kids. Um, yeah, so then after a lot of conversations and uh, a lot of conversations not only with our management team that said, Christina, you can do it, we believe in you. Our investors said, Christina, you can do it, we believe in you. My friend said it. I'm like, okay, if everyone believes it, I'm not sure if I believe myself, but I give it a try. And um, yeah, I love the journey very much since then. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I get uh, goosebumps <laughs> hearing you. But so tell me now, uh, up until now, what do you think are the challenges of leading a, a company you didn't found and you even have, you know, you're side by side with the founder as well. Uh, he's on the board and you work uh, together. And are, do you see any advantages uh, even? Yeah, um, I think a challenge that I, was very concerned about is how will the employees think about it? Because, you know, they join a certain mission. And I think in an early stage startup, you always also somehow join the people, the leaders that are leading this company. So I was always afraid that people would think, Anna, this lady is coming from larger companies. <laughs> she will destroy the fun. That was actually my biggest concern that people would think that about me. Um, but then also, I think just getting everyone on the journey and uh, scale the culture, because I believe as a CEO, if you want it or not, you define culture, how you say things, if you um, raise, bring things up in a sure fix with your team or not, um, if you let things happen, if you don't let them happen, no matter what you do, say, how you act, you define culture. And I think that's a very individual topic based on a personality. And I, um, I think Ben and me were not so far from each other in a lot of things, but ultimately we're different people. And I loved the culture that he brought into the company and I really, really wish for that I can scale that because we grew from 50 to 200 people this year. Um, and I'm very glad if I see our engagement scores because ultimately I managed to do that. So that's the internal part. Um, still keeping his vision because I think that's what made the company big and so successful, but basically then managed to also um, professionalize it within the company, strategize it to bring it to the next stage. and. Um, if you have a strong vision, you know, maybe you take different strategic directions how you get there, but still, yeah, you should not forget about the vision. That's in the internal perspective. But then externally, often when I talk to now investors, uh, we're approaching now growth investors, like a lot of people asking me, but where are the founders? And um, like Ben, for example, that he was the former CEO, he usually even pitches with me because he's still a very active part in our company. Um, he represents the company on conferences. Um, he runs the blockchain education sessions within the company. Um, he's even like talking vision with us in the, and in the management board, yeah. even though he's not an act active manager, so to say. So um, I think even externally, I was very concerned that um, 
it would create the idea that the founders don't want to be involved in the company anymore, uh, which is not the case. Um, I'm actually going to run with Ben every week, Tuesday morning, we meet at 7 a.m. and go for a run. So I share my struggles with him. And most importantly, he really takes care of me. He's the person asking me, Christina, don't forget about all the numbers. How are you doing? And are you taking care of yourself? And I'm really, really happy to have him on my side for that. Oh, that sounds great. So yeah, yeah, lucky. Tell me about you. Like, what are your challenges that did you see at the moment? Yeah, I think there is always two sides of one coin. And so what can be a challenge can also be, I think, an opportunity. Um, so in my situation, the founder is not longer visible in the company at all. And um, I think, like you mentioned, the, the challenge can be that a lot of people When you have founded the business, you know, it's your baby, you created the idea, you made it fly with your blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. With that comes a natural form of authority. And so um, people will really listen to you as a founder and maybe not debate and argue so much about things. Uh, so I think, you know, you have a very strong idea and how, how things should be done, which can be Uh, create clarity in the organization when you have a founder um, and the challenge then when you come in as a sort of professional CEO is that you may need to uh, explain things more or like persuade things more and 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 be very sort of stubborn and, and, and thorough and repeat why uh, in a way that maybe as a founder you don't always have to um, but I think The positive side can be that uh, if you didn't found it and it wasn't your idea from the beginning, you know, you're not limited to the original ideas and visions and very clear idea of how it should be done. And uh, this is no criticism to our founder or any other founder, but it's natural. After a while, you'll get a little bit of blindsided because You know, you have a very strong vision and idea of how things should be done and, you know, what, who is the key audience, who is the target customer and, you know, what's this and that. And if you're coming from the outside, uh, you know, you have maybe a little bit more freedom to think in a different way and look at things in a different way and not be bound by that original idea because the consumer evolve, right? The world around us evolve and there may be opportunities and innovative ideas to develop the business that the founder didn't originally think about. So I think that can be a positive sort of side effect of not being um, a founder and leading the business, I think. And I also think that um, as a founder, even if you don't intend to, uh, founder-led companies can become a bit uh, hierarchical. Uh, and it's just because people don't really question your ideas that much. Uh, you obviously did, and that's why you got the CEO seat. I think that's great. I think your founders have a very sort of good perspective on themselves and don't take themselves too sort of serious. But, but um, it's very easy that people always look to the founder and say, what, w what do you think we should do? <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, I think that can create, you know, when you grow, when you're three people, that's fine. When you're several hundred people or thousands of people, that will slow the business down. If you have a long line of people outside and nobody will do anything because it's scaling, they, yeah, uh, yeah with, because they're scared that this, you know, the founder doesn't approve or it's not in line with his vision. Or um, so I think yeah, that can be a positive effect that you you can create a culture that you know removes those kind of sort of uh, bottlenecks um, yeah. in the business. I think in our case, that was quite interesting because he actually approached me and asked me, Christina, how do we go towards mainstream? So that was his ask to me. And I think that's why it was way easier for me from a product perspective already to pave the way towards mainstream. And I think it also helps that we rebrand, that we have a new name. Um, and he absolutely is in love with all of that. And I think that made it easier for him to let go. And it was easier for me um, to feel more like a founder because you cannot do a CEO role like a manager, right? You give up your private life. I mean, I gave up, I would say, 100% of my private life. And I'm constantly reachable for everyone and everything, um, mostly for my employees. Um, and that's a decision. And I think you can only do it if you really feel like a founder to a certain degree. I think also what you just said, I also believe that it helps 
that you um, see the product moving forward more as a yeah, as a product management topic, so to say, you know, to figure out what does your customer really want, not what I personally want, yeah. but what does my customer want? How do exactly. I make sure? And I think, uh, yeah, that was also very helpful to to have a product background here, mm -hmm. where you can take yourself out, your ego out, and saying it's not me. Like I think a lot of founders think they are their company. It's yeah. basically interconnected with them as a human being, and that's not the case, yeah. right? Mm. Huh? Cool. So, um, are there also some challenges that you faced um, when you took over? Uh, well, there are always challenges, right? Uh, I think uh, you, I'm very good that you talked about scaling culture, because I think you have to work very actively in creating a, a scalable culture where people uh, dare to lead themselves, dare to lead their teams, and um, if you're going to maintain a high pace, uh, you know, in a disruptive environment, maybe you need to be able to uh, unleash the power of all the teams um, and to show people that it's okay to take decisions and not just ask their manager every time and uh, to fail, um, make mistakes and succeed. I think uh, that takes a lot of work, uh, in, especially in small companies that are not used to uh, sort of professional sort of scaling management like that. Um, but it's also a great opportunity, I think. But I always think, if somebody asked me, you know, if I'm a founder, what should I think about to prepare my company that one day uh, somebody else might take over? Um, then I would say really focus on the culture uh, to prepare the business uh, to be, aut aut what do you call it, autonomous and not rely on you as a founder. Actually sort of remove the need for yourself in the business to, to create a culture where people dare to challenge you as a founder, uh, like you did with your yeah. founder. I think that's a great, you're a great role model. I think... But um, he let me challenge and I think that's the difference, <laughs> right? I mean, there are other founders... Yeah, yeah but as a founder, like you need to, to allow people to challenge you and create a culture where people actually don't need you every day for decisions or can challenge your ideas and come up with new great ones. And you have to be prepared to kill your darlings and tell everybody that that's okay. And I think that is one really good way of preparing the business long term uh, and not tell people what to do, but to ask them, what yeah. would you want to do? And it may feel like it takes a long time in the beginning because it's much quicker to just tell them what to do because you know, you're, you know, you have the vision, you know so well, this is what we should be doing. So it may feel like it takes a long time, but it will go a long way and make the business, you know, more scalable and faster in the end, I think. I once I received a really good leadership advice from one of my team leads in Zalando back in the days, because I always thought, uh, even when I had my first team lead position back in the days, that I need to prove everyone that I'm smart <laughs> and then I can do it. And she at some point told me, look, in the end it's about like, if people that have worked under you are great people and everyone in the company knows them, then you do a great job, right? In the end, like how you lead your team, that's completely up to you. But people will say, the people in Christina's team are obviously, everyone is like super smart and talented because it shows you can hire, you can put the team together and uh, you're not relying on them. So people can give you even higher positions somewhere else, you know? So that was kind of more career advice, probably what she gave to me. However, I think this really holds true as well in a, in a startup, which is probably easier as an external manager than if you're a founder, because I think a founder, as they're so connected with the company, it is their baby. They've born the baby. You know, the baby didn't come through me. I'm more like Mother Mary, <laughs> <laughs> having suddenly a baby. Um, and, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's very different for me because I, I learn now that the people that I hire into my C-level, they must be very smarter than me. I only hire people in that I learn from because then they can tell me how it's been done and then everyone thinks Christina is leading the company in a great way. And therefore I have to hire better people. Whereas yeah. as a founder often thinks, I have to do everything myself and I have to prove everything myself um, because it's me, it's ultimately my company because I started it. I was there from day one on 
of course I should know better. I'm not saying that everyone is like that, but um, what I observe when I actually talk to a lot of founders, it's what they think is the hardest part. And by the way, I think it's a shame that we don't have a founder here that actually handed over. And I, <laughs> I, I hope we can apply Ben, our founder, actually to hand it over to me to sit here next year and actually share his perspective, because I guess it's a, a very inspiring one as well. Yeah. I'm sure. So Maria, um, what advice uh, would you now give to all the potential upcoming CEOs in the audience, uh, but also maybe founders that have reached a certain scale and uh, yeah, maybe want to hand over at some point? Yeah, so uh, I talked earlier about really prepping the culture and prepping the people and just share your knowledge. Um, because that is, of course, when you don't have a founder in the business anymore at all. You have the advantage of being able to take advice from your founder. Uh, I can't do that, so, um, you know, how do you make sure that the experience and the mistakes that you made aren't remade later? <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, you can, can uh, pay that forward with the, with the team even after you're gone. Um, but I also think to take over as a professional CEO from a founding-led company, I think the advice I would give is just... Um, of course, you need to be humble, right? And listen to people's experience and concerns and idea, but just still being able to balance, have that humility, uh, but still really have confidence in yourself. You know, you were brought on to do that job for a reason. So believe in yourself and just be really stubborn about your goal uh, and your vision and uh, take the opportunity to, you know, set your mark. There is a new sheriff in town, as they say. Um, but of course, make sure to really use the experience from the previous founder and all the people in the business. What, w what would you give as an advice to somebody <laughs> taking over um, from a founder? Um, so I think what was very interesting is that our founder, he reached out, I think for a longer period of time, even before he told me, um, he was asking his trust people in the company if they think he's still the right person for the next stage. Um, so he, I think he was proactive enough to get feedback. And until today, that's what I often do, that I ask the people um, that I'm really trusting in the company if they think I'm the right person for this job, right? And it's not that I don't trust myself, but it's always good to, to get an outside perspective sometimes and a confirmation as well, right? Um, the second thing is also talk a lot, like it sounds always so simple, but communication is really key here that you can be open and share also about your emotions because that thing is very emotional and I think yeah. it's driven by emotions and that's the reason why often these things don't go so well. Um, what Ben and I did like for um, a few weeks, every night we were on the phone and sharing about like, how do you currently feel? I told him, I feel left alone by you because I came here because of you as a CEO and now you just want to throw everything at me. And he said, I'm not going to throw it at you. I just think like I want to encourage you to go that step because everyone believes in you. So it was a lot of like conversation. Um, how can we make that work? And initially we even discussed if we do it as a co-CEO or not. And, uh, but we, just, we were super openly sharing our thoughts when we're not holding back, super genuine, super honest. And I think this is what made this whole transition also so successful that we could speak openly about it. Yeah. Um, but I also believe like as if you, if you are maybe in a C-level position and uh, you are in a good spot, um, also talk to, um, talk to your founder, say maybe, hey, um, I bring some skills that can support you. Um, so also like even open their eyes for this possibility that you might be in a good spot. I mean, why not bringing yourself up as well? Um, because I think a lot of founders are very, very grateful if they get the right feedback, if um, they're being made aware of their blind spots because on the one side, it gives them the opportunity to grow and being coached on them, but also it gives them the opportunity to reflect on themselves and maybe come up uh, with such a decision um, for themselves at some point. I think, yeah, communication is absolutely key for that. Yeah, great advice. Thank you. We could talk for hours about this, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, All so, right. Um, I think we're wrapping up for today. So we learned uh, a lot that um, communication is obviously key. Um, if, you, if you get into this situation, um, I think it doesn't necessarily mean also for, for the VCs in the room that if there is a founder um, maybe moving out of a management situation that it's um, disadvantageous for, uh, for a company because there can be still a, a great collaboration. 
Um, I think it's important to be humble, to, to show empathy also for the employees, to listen to them. Um, yeah, and just, I think, understand that we're all human beings and these situations are just very, very delicate. And I think there is a lot of different actors that we have to look into. There is the employees, there's the company that buys into something. Um, you have the VC side, they invested maybe in people in a very early stage. Um, it's also very important in perspective because then if someone takes over later on, that's maybe not the person they invested in. Um, but then it's the two main actors as well. It's the management board as well, because the constellation in your management will, will definitely change as well. Yeah, and um, I think also as a professional CEO, it's important to, you know, as long as the person have passion, you know, yes. passion and the right background um, uh, and the right experience and, and the energy, uh, you know, even if you didn't found the company, it doesn't mean that you're not able to take the company to even higher grounds. Um, so that's what I would finish off with. All right, Thank I would say to much. the higher rounds of successful yeah. companies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you.